Okay, so um, I am meeting with you and going over this soon, but I wanted to go ahead and do a recorded version too, so you can go back and check it out later. So today we're going to be talking about drawing strategies, and for our purposes, it is helpful if you have your sketchbook available um, or your newsprint. So your, ah, sorry, cat's in the way. So your smaller sketchbook like this, or your big, um, your big newsprint pad, and have at least one of your pencils, okay? And beforehand, though I do link the video in these slides, we've already gone over it in class, please make sure that you have sharpened uh, at least one of your pencils correctly. So like this with a lot of the lead exposed, so that we can go over the different grips and things. And um, if you want, you can pause this video and do the exercises we go over as we go along with the video. Okay, drawing strategies. So the first thing that um, I talk about seems super obvious, but it's it's a good way to start. So when we're looking at something that we're going to draw, and I talk about this in a video we look at later um, in a, the lecture about citing, uh, measuring, and mapping drawing. Um, but one of the first things to do before we even get into this is to choose your orientation. So for your orientation, what I mean is portrait, vertical, or landscape horizontal. Okay, so for our purposes today, for the, the kind of exercises we're going to do, probably landscape or horizontal is the, the way we're going to want to hold our pad. But generally speaking, you look at whatever you're drawing and try to determine which way you need to orient your uh, sketchbook or drawing pad or canvas or whatever it is you're working on based on some pretty simple logic. So if the height of what you're looking at, how tall it is, exceeds the width, how wide it is, you want a vertical or portrait orientation. If the width exceeds the height, how tall it is, you want a horizontal or landscape orientation. Okay, so I know that seems pretty basic, but this is drawing one. We try to go through the basics uh, step by step so that we don't accidentally leave anything out. So my hair's a little crazy today. Okay, so here are just some examples. On the left here, we have a vertical or portrait orientation. On the right, we have a horizontal um, or landscape orientation. Okay, holding your drawing tool. Now, in class, we have already watched a um, video talking about the different kinds of grips you can use with your uh, pencil or your charcoal or your pen. But in this lecture, I go into that with a little more detail because as we've talked about, the way this class starts out, we sort of just jump in both feet and we start doing our en plein air drawing. We just go outside and we're drawing what we see and we're making observational kind of sketches, right? So now that we have finished that unit, we're going back in and kind of refining some of these things that we were just sort of testing out before. Okay, so we're gonna go back over the grips today. So um, one of the things that you may remember from that video, and it is linked here as well, so you can go back into these slides and review that video as well if you want, is figuring out what kind of grip makes the most sense for what you want to draw. Now, as you may remember, some of them are better for um, the initial sketching, the kind of gesture drawings that we do at the beginning of uh, a composition, and for making larger, broader, looser kind of strokes. And some of the grips are better for doing very small kind of detail work, right? So think about what you're drawing. Usually you're going to want to start with a paintbrush grip or um, an underhand grip, or some people just prefer the overhand grip, but something that you can use your entire arm and move from the shoulder when you're doing your initial drawing. And then as you work down into the details and refine, you might switch to a tripod grip um, or a tip grip, right? To, to kind of get in and refine some of those details. Um, the other thing is is basically not just on uh, the way that we're holding the pencil, but also uh, how far back are we going to hold it. So for paintbrush grip, we're always going to be pretty far back, right? We're going to go over these in a little more detail in a second. But for tripod grip, which tripod grip remembers how we naturally, how we tend to hold a pencil when we write, how we were taught to hold a pencil when we write. So for tripod grip, for example, you can be really tight and, and up close on the lead, um, for detail work, which is more like how we hold a pencil when we write, but you can still use tripod grip and hold it further back so it becomes 
paintbrush grip and closer to paintbrush grip so that you have a little bit larger of a range of motion. Whenever possible, we want to work from our shoulder, right? Broad sweeping kind of um, movements, we want to work from the shoulder. If we're working on very little details, then we're more up in our fingers and our wrist, right? Okay, so here are the five grips that I use the most. There are some other grips. Um, some people use inverted quite a lot. It's not a grip that I use very often, and I think for beginning drawing, it's a little bit confusing to extend beyond these basic grips. So we are just going to focus on these five, okay? And in these slides, I have illustrations showing um, how you hold the, the drawing tool, your, your pencil, your pen, your charcoal in these grips, and uh, talk, I'll talk a little bit more about what we use them for. So the basic ones that I use a lot and that I think make the most sense for us to use in drawing one are underhand, overhand, paintbrush, tripod, and what I call tip, okay? Okay, so the first one is the overhand grip. So when you're doing overhand, it's just kind of like this. Um, you're mostly focusing on these fingers and your thumb. These fingers you can kind of rest on on the, the pencil or pen or charcoal, or you can kind of have them up. I tend to have them up some of the time, uh, particularly for some reason my ring finger I don't really put down. It doesn't matter so much what you do with your ring finger and your pinky. You mostly are focusing on your index finger and your thumb. So this is what overhand grip looks like. Now, as you may remember from our video and our previous discussion, overhand and underhand are the same in terms of where your hand is, right? So for underhand, uh, your back of your hand is going to be toward the surface you're drawing on, toward your paper, and for overhand, your palm is going to be toward your paper. And that's the only real difference. For underhand, we can make larger, very sweeping, big kind of gestures. For overhand, we can as well, but it's slightly more limited, right? It's more like, it feels more like it's, um, the movement's mostly in the elbow as opposed to the shoulder with um, underhand, okay? So those two are kind of sneaky in that they're really the same grip, it's just the position of our hand, okay? Uh, the next one is paintbrush grip. Sometimes you see this referred to as brush grip. I've also seen it called um, drumstick grip, which I think is very odd, I guess because the way your hand on the pencil, it looks a little bit like a, a, a turkey leg, like a drumstick or something. Um, so basically, this is called paintbrush grip or brush grip because this is how we tend to hold a paintbrush, okay? So uh, with your pencil, you're holding it like this. You can see in the illustration up there, you have your hand kind of like this. And this is another one where you can use your whole arm, or you can flip it and kind of get a little bit more detailed and more control and move from your wrist or your elbow. So it's a very versatile grip. It's probably the one that I personally use the most when I'm drawing, I, I find. So this is a good one to work on and try out. The next one, this is the tripod grip. Um, in class, when I demonstrate this, I usually, I think I started with this one from the beginning because this is kind of our default grip. This is how you hold a pencil, how you're taught to hold a pencil or a pen in school to write. So in, in the art world, we call that tripod grip. Some people still call it um, writing grip or scribe grip, but basically it's just holding a pencil like you would to write with. Um, it's good for details. So you're moving really just your fingers a little bit from your wrist when you're using this grip. It's good for detail work. The thing about tripod grip is, though, that you can back up your grip if you want to um, make it a little bit more versatile and be able to make larger gestures. And when you back up your grip even further, you can see it turns into paintbrush grip, right? So it's also um, a more versatile grip than we think it is if you think about your hand position and where your hand is, where your fingers are on the pencil. Okay, the last one is what I call tip grip. So it's basically the uh, overhand or underhand grip, but you're just putting your index finger right up on the tip of the lead like this. And it's good um, if you need to make darker marks, because remember our our graphite, our lead, is, is a little bit fragile because we've stripped all the wood away. So if you need to really press down, this is good for that, okay? Uh, when you're trying to do the darker kind of shading, basically the darker values and you need some pressure, this is very good for that. Okay, so here is just a little video on holding and controlling your pencil. You can watch that in your own time and it's basically just demonstrating the grips that we just looked at. 
Okay, the next thing, this is another thing that I know seems kind of obvious, but uh, one of the things that's important when we're making art is our posture. Now, you might think back to your your mom or your aunt or your dad or your grandma or whoever, maybe your, your teacher, um, saying, sit up straight, sit up straight. And that seems kind of juvenile and, and silly and like it doesn't really matter. It does in drawing. So when... When we're working, if you have an easel, if you have the ability to stand while you work, that's going to give you the greatest range of motion. You can use your whole shoulder, you can use your whole body. Um, if you are uh, in a situation where you need to sit while you work, sit up straight. I know that sounds silly, but if you're kind of hunched over like this, you get in your own way and you aren't able to have as free of a range of motion as if you're sitting up straight. The other thing, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about uh, sighting, measuring, and mapping, stay in one position, okay? So when you're working, particularly when you're working precisely, when you're sighting, you don't want to move around a lot because it's going to alter your measurements. It alters your perspective, and so it's going to alter the way everything looks proportionally and in relationship to each other in the still life or in the, the human form or whatever it is you're drawing. So you want to stay in whatever position you start in, generally speaking, when you are doing a drawing. Okay, and then if you finish that drawing and you want to get more information uh, and do another sketch from another position, by all means. But while you're working on one drawing, try to stay in the same position. When you're sighting and measuring, you want to extend your arm fully when you do that so that it's always the same measurement. You don't want to work from here and then here and then here because it's going to change your measurement. We'll talk about that more when we talk about sighting, measuring, and mapping. Okay, the other thing is to make sure you have enough room. Right, so if you're working uh, from home or in the classroom or the studio, you want to kind of swing around a little bit and make sure that you have plenty of room so that you can engage your entire arm, your whole shoulder, your whole body when you're drawing. Okay, so here's just a, a, a classroom setup. You can see the people are nicely spaced. You can see the people who are sitting have been uh, told to sit up straight so that they, they have a consistent kind of posture, a consistent positioning. This is um, another tip that I find is helpful. So I say over and over again, draw what you see, not what you know. And that's really important. And I still mean for you to do that. I want for you to draw what you see. I don't want you to come up with something in your head that you think what you're drawing is supposed to look like. But I do want you to visualize the whole piece. We've said this word before, but the word gestalt, right? So that's the whole, drawing the whole instead of drawing one individual piece. Some of you ran into this on one of our um, early exercises when we did the Picasso drawing that's upside down. I know it's pretty common to start working on that and then run out of space, right? Maybe you just got the head or just the head and shoulders and you didn't, you weren't able to fit the whole thing on the, on the paper. That is because you weren't visualizing. So at the beginning of your um, drawing, of your sketch, you want to set some parameters for yourself. So basically, um, we've picked our orientation, whether it's horizontal or vertical, and then just make a couple marks to show the bounds of where the highest point in the drawing will be, the lowest point, the furthest right, the furthest left. That way you have a parameter in which you're working, and you can do some kind of general light sketches to lay in the general shapes that you're seeing, and that will help you keep everything proportional and make everything fit inside uh, what you're talking about, what you're, what you're describing, what you're, what you're, right, you're uh, drawing. So this is um, just a still from the video on um, sighting, measuring, and mapping. So you can see uh, this. I'm more precisely mapping here, but you can you can see you you get an idea of the parameters of what you're drawing, and then you map, you lay it out kind of generally on your paper so that you know it will all fit on the page. Okay, and again, just to reinforce this, sketch the whole, not the parts. Gestalt. This is the word that we've seen before, but we'll bring it back in. And the drawing on the right side of the brain in that lecture, I talk about gestalt. Okay, so you want to approximate the subject matter with as few lines as possible. So by this, I'm not just talking about this, where you have kind of a map uh, in terms of composition, like where everything's going to fit on, on your page and make sure it fits on the page. I want you to go in and do a couple of sketches. So if you're doing um, a, a figural form, you want to get in like where's the top of the head, where's the bottom of the feet, what's the general kind of shape of the body. It's kind of like our gesture drawings. So when we do our en plein air and we do the gesture drawings of the trees, the six gestures, that's just to kind of get a feel 
of what the whole looks like and we start with the light kind of sketching of the whole before we refine in and start doing the individual clumps in the leaves and then the individual leaves and the texture of the bark. So think back to that exercise, how we started with the whole with light sketching and then refined down to the individual parts. So that's basically what I'm saying now. So you don't want to go in and finish any single little part. Like if you're drawing a face, you don't want to draw one eye and then be like, oh, I have to do the whole rest of the face because it's going to make things kind of off, kind of wonky. Okay, so basically rather than finishing one single part right away, you want to kind of lightly sketch in the hole and then bring everything into visibility, um, sharpen and refine everything uh, kind of in phases so that everything is, is becoming more realized um, in the same way. Some of you I know on your self-portraits, I make you do a self-portrait at the beginning of the class before you've had any instruction and you work really, really, really hard on one part and then you look at the clock and see that you've used almost all your 30 minutes. Same kind of idea. You want to sketch everything in lightly and then you're going to refine down from there. Um, you want to make intelligent and informed corrections. So you're going to lay everything out and it's not going to be completely right the first time. And you're going to look at how the parts work together in the whole and fix them. Okay. And again, the same degree of resolution throughout. We start kind of light and sketchy. We refine to more detailed and more uh, sharp. Okay. Here's just an example. You can see on the very right, this is the beginning kind of gestural sketch, and then the work becomes more and more refined. Keep it sharp. This is another thing that probably seems obvious, but you want to keep the, the your drawing tool sharp. So anytime you are drawing, you want to have your X-Acto knife and your sandpaper ready so that you can sharpen your pencil as the tip dulls. Same for your charcoal. Um, your pen keeps itself sharp, obviously. But you want to keep it uh, sharp and you want to make sure that you're sharpening your pencil correctly so you always have a nice long piece of lead. And here again, we've already watched this, but here's a link to that video about how to properly sharpen your pencil. Okay, so now let's talk about exercise four. This is your grip practice. So for exercise four, I want you to demonstrate the five grips that I just talked about. And um, to do that, I want for you to draw a circle a rectangle and a triangle using each grip and I want you to label them. So they should look a little bit different. On tripod we should have um, maybe sharper kind of lines but a little bit jerkier, shorter. On paintbrush we should have more uh, wider sweeping kind of lines. So just it's kind of honor system because I'm not watching you do them but please try these grips and try to keep your hand in the position of whichever grip you're doing and demonstrate um, by making these basic geometric shapes. Okay, so if you want to do that now, you can go ahead and pause the video or you can do it after. Okay, now let's talk about some drawing techniques. So we know how to sharpen our pencil, we know different ways to hold our pencil. Let's go ahead and make some marks. So the basic drawing techniques, and we've touched on this a little bit in class, particularly when I was giving the lecture about drawing the trunk of the tree and the bark and working on texture. Um, so we have stippling, we have hatching, we have cross hatching, and we have circulism. So these are the basic kinds of marks that are going to help us not only define texture, but also value. We'll talk more about texture and value. They each um, have kind of sections where we talk about them later in the semester. But basically, we want to practice making these different kind of marks now that we have these different ways of holding the pencil. So not just like the writing grip tripod, right? Try making these marks in the different grips. Um, and again, this is also how, this isn't just how we're going to make flat marks like this, this is also how we're going to make marks that make things look three-dimensional, right? Okay, so here is um, a video you can watch that's about circulism, which is also called scumbling. Circulism and scumbling are the same thing, so that's where you're making the kind of little scribbly sort of marks to fill in texture or value. Here's one on stippling, which is just the making the individual dots. Here's one on hatching versus cross-hatching. And then we get to exercise five, which is just about mark making. So for exercise five, I want you to demonstrate hatching, cross hatching, stippling, scumbling, or circulism, same thing again, and smudging with your blending tool. So in your drawing kit, you also have a uh, blending tool called a trillion. Uh, you actually have three of them. So I should have opened this before, I'm sorry. This 
your blending tool, right? So for the smudging or the blending, whichever way you want to label it, this is what I want you to do. So for this, you're going to lay in a lot of um, marks and value kind of shading with your um, graphite, and then you're going to go in and kind of smudge it with your blending stump. Um, and I want you to demonstrate these in for 2D flat looking mark making and also th more three-dimensional illusions. So as you can see in the example here, you have kind of a, sh a sphere that you're working in and then a flat plane. So I would like for you to do that kind of a demonstration for each of these. And here's just some other examples of how that looks. Okay, so that is drawing techniques and strategies um, and exercise four and five. Okie dokie.